Okay, well, it's uh, about almost five after, and it seems like everybody's here who wants to be here. So uh, let's get started. I'm going to paste these uh, links again, post that one more time in case um, you missed it the first time I posted. Um, there's a website for this workshop, and I, it's probably a good idea to just open that up and, uh, and find it and have it open in a tab. And um, there's only really two sections of the website. There's the home page here, which gives you a little intro to, to what we're going to be doing today. And, um, uh, and also a reminder that this is the uh, next generation shiny apps with BS Lib workshop uh, at our medicine. So hopefully you're in the right place. Um, and this uh, intro page will walk you through getting set up and there'll be a little bit of time where you can, you can kind of do that or you can uh, do that in the background while I'm kind of introducing everything for the workshop. And then there's also um, a page that says workshop with kind of a list of the things that uh, I'm hoping or expecting or planning to cover today. Um, and I'm just going to go right to the welcome get getting started. And uh, I'll open this up and uh, open up these slides so we can we can talk. So um, hello and welcome, everyone. Um, like I said, this is the next generation shiny apps with BS Lib. Um, and I'm Garrick, uh, Garrick Aiden Bowie. Uh, you can find me online at GarrickAidenBowie.com or on Mastodon, and those kinds of places. Uh, but in uh, day to day, I work for uh, Posit on the Shiny team. I joined Shiny about a year and a half ago, more or less. And most of my time in the past, or at least in the first year uh, on the Shiny team was working with BS Lib. Um, and I noticed that I might have frozen. I hope, is that just, am I back? Did I freeze for a second? Um, I, I can't tell if that was. The whole, I was hearing you fine the whole time. Okay, did my camera freeze? It, it Not on my end. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, thank you Zoom for for that little wrinkle. But thank you, I'm glad that you're here to, to confirm that. Okay, so um, yeah, so I've been working with Shiny uh, BS Lib. Right, this is which is the package we're going to be talking about, and um, I've been working mostly in BSLib for the last year. So I'm excited to share some of the the things that we've been working on, some of the vision that we have for the package in general, and how it fits into the Shiny ecosystem and into the future of Shiny. So um, before we get started, just a couple quick little things about the workshop to set sort of expectations for what we're going to be doing today. Um, we're planning on this being about three hours until uh, two p.m. Eastern. Um, I, ex I would like to use breakout groups uh, for exercises, and we'll talk about the setup for that in a little bit. Um, please feel free to turn your video on if you want to, or, um, or unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, it is helpful to see your faces. On, at the same time, I understand that um, you, you, know, you might not be in a place where video is, um, is easier or appropriate. So I'll also, I have the chat window open as well. You are welcome to use chat at any time, just drop a question in there. Um, or you can use the raise your hand feature of Zoom. If you use uh, chat and you write a question in the chat, if you would like, if you for some reason would like me to not, or sorry, me, let me back that up. So if you have a question in chat, I might call on you to uh, read your question out loud uh, so we can talk about it. Um, if you would prefer that I just read your question for you, uh, please put a star at the start of the question and I'll just read it. and. Um, no worries. Um, Zoom has this cool little feature called raising hands, I guess, uh, where if you um, find the, the bar at the bottom of the Zoom window, there's the reactions um, tab, you click on that, and then there's a raise hand button there. And um, I'm pretty sure that floats you to the top of my participants list, and I'll be able to see that and, uh, and call on you. Um, and uh, you would use that method if you want to um, either use voice or, or video. Uh, so feel free to, to use that feature. Okay, uh, really quickly, there is a code of conduct for the workshop uh, and for our medicine in general. Please behave professionally. Um, and that, that's pretty much it. If anybody, if there's any kind of issue that happens uh, today, I really hope that there isn't. But if there is, I you can reach out to me with a private chat or to Emily, who is uh, the, also the host on this meeting. Um, or reach out to me during the breakout sessions. 
Okay, so how do I envision these breakout sessions working? Um, there's a, a, a lovely concept called pair programming, uh, which is something that I really enjoy, which is basically working together with other people um, on writing code. And I'm hoping we can kind of use that as a model for the breakout sessions. Um, we have about, um, I, I'm imagining we'll use about five people per breakout group, or something like that, four or five people per breakout group. And when you when you move into a breakout session, um, the model for pair programming is basically that one person drives, like one person is the person who actually writes the code. And, um, and in this case, if one person could volunteer themselves to share the share their screen during the session, that would be extremely helpful. Um, and that way, you know, not everyone needs to share their screen, but we can all still work together. The role of the other people, usually pair programming is two people, but we can, you know, this is somewhere between pair programming and mob programming. But the, the role of the person who is not driving, as in not actually typing the code into the screen or clicking the mouse around, is to uh, is to help out, to, to watch what the person who is driving is doing, review their code, give them some guidance, say, hey, oops, you missed a comma or a parentheses here or there, or maybe go look something up in the documentation. Um, and hopefully together, working together, you know, the exercises will be kind of smooth sailing, uh, but a fun way to practice uh, what we've been, what we talk about today during our, our sessions. Um, in the, in the breakout groups, if you can turn video on, again, that would be awesome, or, you know, feel free to chat. Uh, obviously, it'll be more engaging or exciting for everybody else if there's um, a little, a, a, a slightly higher level of engagement. And when we come back into the regular group, feel free to turn your video back off, for example, or remute yourself or whatever. Um, well, I'll try to shuffle the, I think I'll try to keep things, if I can manage Zoom well, I will try to keep things where we um, use the same breakout groups within each hour, but maybe shuffle so you get a little bit of um, additional contact with everyone else in the workshop. And hopefully you meet some cool people. Okay. So that's a, that's it. That's how the workshop works. Okay, so let's actually get into talking about this. So what is BSLib? Well, first of all, first back in, you know, the uh, uh, first there was this package called Shiny. Um, and actually not really because before Shiny, there was this package, this web framework called BSLib. So we have to go back just a little bit more. When Shiny came around, um, it, uh, it, we shiny used this bootstrap web framework as a way to um, lay out the UI elements and to get and to make web apps that look actually pretty good. Um, and bootstrap is is uh, was actually created by a couple of engineers at Twitter. And it was released in 2011. And at the time, it was like one of the first web frameworks um i mean there, there have been lots of web frameworks in the history of the the web but this was one of the first that was just like a really nice combination of css with which is how the web pages are styled and and a bunch of html kind of templates that were easy to use and it just uh, it just took the web by storm, and you know pretty soon everybody was using Bootstrap to style their websites. Um, and when Joe uh, built Shiny in, in 2012 um, and released it, he used Bootstrap as a quick way to to you know to make sure or to just make apps that look really nice. So it was a it was a, a win for everybody. Um, in 2013 so two years later bootstrap i think you know when we when shiny started using bootstrap it was on version two and then in 2013 bootstrap released version three which was a complete rewrite of, of bootstrap and they have a tendency to do this every you know three to five years and um and then shiny in 2014 moved to using bootstrap three so so shiny has a pretty um you know, a pretty tight history with Bootstrap and Bootstrap it's is pretty integrated into into Shiny. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm realizing now that, you know, I'm assuming most of everyone here is uh, aware of what Shiny is and what it does in the R world. Um, 
But if you are not, then, you know, or if you want me to like talk a little bit more about the background of, of like what Shiny is or what it does, um, you can drop me a note and I will, I will backtrack just a little bit. Um, okay, but in 2014, the, um, the Shiny engineers uh, at the time, mostly Winston and, and Joe, uh, made a big push to move Shiny from Bootstrap 2 to Bootstrap 3. And since then, Shiny is still using, for the most part, Bootstrap 3. And this is sort of a feature and a bug at the same time. Um, it's On the one hand, it's really nice that uh, Shiny has been so stable over so many years. And on the other hand, it would be really nice to have some more modern uh, UI styling and elements, right? So let's let's take a look at, like, fundamentally what Shiny does and how it works. And this workshop is where you're focusing almost entirely on front end code. So in a Shiny app, you have two pieces. You have a, a UI side, which is how you define like what shows up in the app and what people see when they come to use your your Shiny app. And um, and then there's a server side. And on the server side is where you kind of do all of, write all of the R code that is really about the logic of how data flows through your app and you know what happens when you change an input and that kind of thing. And um, so the apps that we see today are gonna involve a lot of server code that we are just not going to talk about at all. We are gonna focus almost entirely on front end code. So what happens in the front end? What happens in the UI of a Shiny app? And um, so this is the part I think that, uh, well, you know, the server part is is really, really awesome, but also the part where you can write, where Shiny lets you write R functions, and you don't have to think about web stuff at all. You can just think about, here, I have a numeric input, and I've given it an ID so that I can use that on the server side. Um, it has a label that I know, you know, will show up in the, and, you know, tell people what this, you know, input is about. And... Um, I'm going to set it to an initial value, give it a min and max range. And when, um, and what Shiny does is basically takes this idea of a numeric input that I have, you know, specified in R code, and it turns it into basically raw HTML. Like if you wanted to make this, if you wanted to make a web page on your own, you would have to write all of these things. There's a lot of extra stuff in here. Like there's divs and labels and inputs and, um, and some people find that fun to write all of this, and some people, you know, prefer to just think about the the stuff that uh, just matters for the thing that you're trying, the input that you're trying to create. And um, if we took this just basic raw HTML and we put it into the browser, it would look like this. Um, it would, you know, here's the label. Our academic year start is here in the label element, which shows up here. And then we have um, we have an input where the value in here is going to be a number, and you can move it up and down by one. And it started at 2012, right? Okay, um, that's the extent of what happens with this code. This doesn't actually like connect to a server or anything. I'm only moving like this isn't connected to anything. It just first of all, it's not connected to anything, and then second of all, um, it looks pretty basic. So what Bootstrap does is it takes the, takes the same HTML. Um, this, you know, the same basic structure of the HTML, but now it has, we've sprinkled in um, just a couple classes. So the, we've got the form group class. Uh, we've got control label class here. We've got another class on the input element. And now that we have these classes with bootstrap, our input looks quite a bit different. Um, and it's definitely more stylish and it's more what we have come to expect when we go to a website and see uh, an input like this, right? So that's the role of Bootstrap is to go from, uh, to take this kind of HTML and that looks kind of boring and turn it into something that looks better, right? Um, and over the years, the, the sort of styles of Bootstrap have evolved somewhat, but they're still pretty similar. So here's what Bootstrap 3 looks like, which we were just looking at. And here's what Bootstrap 5 looks like, the most recent version of Bootstrap. It's uh, a little bit, you know, it's pretty similar, but also a little bit different, right? Um, okay. 
So BSLib, where does BSLib enter into this? So I think, you know, we kind of learned from the experience of moving from Bootstrap 2 to Bootstrap 3 that Shiny is very tightly integrated with with that, uh, with the, the HTML markup that we create. So, you know, there are a lot of assumptions that we make about what that HTML is going to look like and how we're going to interact with it. That's going to like power all of the, the server side of things. Um, so for, so BSLib kind of came into this thinking, you know, Bootstrap is coming out with version four and version five, um, and how do we bring those into Shiny rather than rewriting everything that's inside of Shiny when we want to upgrade from one bootstrap version to another? And so that was the first kind of task of, of BSLib. And then the second task of BSLib is also like, let's make it possible to do theming and to change the appearance of a Shiny app easily and quickly without doing a whole lot of extra work. And, um, and so this is what BSLib started doing. So you the idea with bslib was that you could take bslib and it gives you a theme a bs theme uh, function that you pass to a theme argument of one of the page functions in shiny and here you could say version 5 right so i want bootstrap version 5 and do nothing to the rest of your app and your app would just automatically be using bootstrap 5 and look and look much better so here's what uh you know what that would look like um, with version five. And, uh, and so then the other part of this, you know, that, that part's cool. So now we've like upgraded to version five. This is a shiny, this is a shiny input now on version five on bootstrap version five. Um, but then also to make theming more accessible and more fun, we need, um, we added this, this idea of presets. So the nomenclature has changed a little bit over the years. We, BS theme originally was just about bringing in also boot swatch themes. Boot swatch is like a collection of pre-built preset uh, bootstrap themes. And recently we've added uh, our own to that collection. So we had to move away from just calling this argument boot swatch. So a preset is like a bootstrap theme preset that's sort of ready to go. You can leave it like that and get a new theme for your Shiny app, or you could um, you could build on top of it and make some changes. So here is um, the Darkly boot swatch preset. You know, you, you change one argument and the next thing you know, you have a brand new, uh, brand new looking app. Um, and then here recently, like in the last, uh, within the last year, we started working on um, a shiny specific preset. So you can see this is a little bit different from the stock Bootstrap 5. Uh, there's a like higher contrast and uh, on the on the input and a couple other things, a font that Posit likes and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so now um, if you use BS theme without these arguments, this is the default that you'll get. You'll get version 5 with preset shiny. So Within BS theme, um, basically, if you're using BS theme, you're going to set a choose a preset. Then um, you also can set bootstrap variables um, there throughout the bootstrap documents. There are mentions of these SAS variables that they use and you can change them directly from BS theme. So here, uh, for example, I'm saying I want primary to be a specific color. And so primary is like the accent color for for like action buttons and things like that. And success, I want to be this other color. Um, these are roughly like, I think, blue and green um, for those who don't can't translate <laughs> hex in their heads like me. Um, no, I just happen to know that that's what they are. And then you can also uh, enter, you know, grab fonts from Google. So here, uh, these last two lines are saying, I want to use uh, enter from Google fonts for the base font, and I want to use JetBrains Mono for the code font, and um, and you know just like that, you rebuild Bootstrap's SAS into CSS. You get a whole new Bootstrap theme, and um, and it's pretty neat. So uh, if if you're interested, if like if you're really interested in this part of uh, BSLib, this is probably we'll do a little exercise now on that where you get to practice using these things. But beyond that. Um, 
the you know we won't the rest of the workshop is going to be mostly talking about the other new th newer things that BSLib has added, but uh, a good introduction to theming is the get started theming article, and if you're wondering how you find these kinds of um, these kinds of SAS variables that I mentioned that you can change in a theme you we have a page uh, on, in and in, um, in the BSLib docs where under theming, you can go to theming variables, and here you can see um, like a whole list of these things. Fortunately, there's a search, so if you're interested in like finding things that are related to primary, for example, um, you can find them. You know, or like if you want to search for fonts, this is a good way to to look at what variables are available uh, as for for a specific kind of thing. And sometimes they'll give you <laughs> like. There's not a ton of information about what they do other than the name, but sometimes, uh, but you can also kind of go to the source and sometimes that helps too. Um, okay, so, uh, so with this theming aspect of BSLib, um, we started to realize that sometimes that if all you really want to do is switch from a fluid page with uh, Bootstrap version five to, uh, sorry, if you want to switch from fluid page with the bootstrap version of three to a fluid page with the bootstrap version of five, um, maybe we could make that a little bit easier. And so we started adding uh, functions to BSLib that would do that kind of thing. So you can simply replace page, you can replace fluid page with page fluid. And um, and the rest of your app basically works the same exact way, except now you have uh, the latest version of Bootstrap and the latest shiny preset theme from BSLib. Um, you can still use everything else that's in shiny inside of your app and you don't have to change anything, but PageFluid um, basically just, you know, gets you the newest Bootstrap versions and everything. Okay, so now it's your turn. Um, I'm going to copy these, paste those links again. Um, in case, because I noticed some people have joined while I was talking. So, um, in in this workshop, we're going to use a, a data set that I've collected from the um, in the Department of Education in the United States. It's called the College Scorecard data, and it includes data about college enrollment, enrollment, student aid, costs, student outcomes uh, from academic years 1996 through 2022. Um, and there are basically two tables there one the first table is called school and it gives you some information about each college in the data set and then there's another data a table called scorecard which gives you historical data on the cost of the school the enrollment outcomes the scorecard is by academic year and school is one row per college um, there's a in in the posit cloud project you'll find a um, You'll find a uh, there's a package that's already installed called College Scorecard, and loading that package with Library College Scorecard brings in these two tables, so they're ready to use as soon as you do that. Okay. So in this next um, in this next section, we're going to your job is to find the exercises folder. Um, all of our exercises for today are there, um, and there's an app called zero one app there's also a solution there uh, don't go look at the solution uh, try try it without looking at the solution but if you get stuck you can go look at the solution and, and see what's happening and maybe get yourself unstuck um, the goal of this exercise is mostly just to make sure that everybody's set up and ready to go and um, the task is to take the shiny app that's there and make it bs libier uh, by switching out the page function uh, maybe looking around to see what other page types are, are available. <coughs> Try out a new uh, Bootstrap or Bootswatch theme, and then use the app uh, to learn a little bit about the school data set to kind of get uh, a, a little bit of a feeling for the school data set. So um, I'm going to figure out how to send everyone to uh, breakout sessions. Um, while I do that, I'm going to go back to the website very quickly. And on the home page, I just want to make sure that you've seen this. If you are um, wanting to just get up, set up very, very quickly, uh, on the homepage, you go to using Posit Cloud and follow these in instructions. Um, 
you can sign up for a free account for Posit Cloud and then um, join the uh, R Medicine 2024 BSLib space. And once you're there, there's a project that if you, it, it's a, an assignment, which means that when you click on it, it just automatically creates a copy for you that becomes yours to use for the rest of the workshop. Um, I'm going to leave this up while I figure out how to send everyone into breakout groups. And um, and when we're in the breakout groups, we will have, um, you'll have a few, yeah, I, I'll send like a one minute warning when it's time to come back. Okay. Um, all right, hold on. Breakout group. Create 10, okay. Okay. All right, I'm gonna send everyone to breakout group. Uh, have fun and I'll see you in a few minutes.
right. Welcome back. Uh, I hope that went well. Would anybody like to report um, how their breakout, how things went in their breakout group? Were there any troubles getting set up? Did anybody find my typo in the apps? Feel free to feel free to just go ahead and unmute if you want, and if anyone wants to give a little, a small little update. Well, I can say, all we did was just change from change to page fluid. That's only that's as far as we got. But it worked, right? <clears throat> Right. Then okay. we tried to figure out how to get a different theme in there because you, you showed that, but I forgot what the syntax was. Yeah. So you, you did something like the, Let me make this bigger. Sorry. Uh, we probably did something yeah, like Yeah, right this. there. A preset. I was trying to remember how to, how to do the preset. Yeah. But you can do, um, you can also use boot swatch still. That, so that's still around if you, if you remember that better. Um, let me, see if this save and reload and yeah that works um or you can call it a preset uh, which is the sort of newer newer term yeah cool uh okay great so uh, any other anyone else with questions about did, did we learn it did anyone learn anything about the data set from this um Maybe we'll do that together real quick. So we have, um, so this app was kind of designed, let me go back to my favorite preset, which is the shiny preset. And um, reload. Yeah, okay, so this, uh, this app is basically kind of walking through the school table. And the school table has a bunch of different variables like state, so there are the states you would expect plus a few that you might not. Um, the dom predominant degree of the, the school or college, the highest degree, bachelor, graduate, associate cert certificate of the school or college. Control is whether or not it's a for-profit or non-profit or public school. Um, locale type tells you whether it's in a city, a suburb, a town, or a rural area. And then size combines with that to tell you sort of the size of either the city or the size of, or the distance of the town or rural area from, um, so yeah, kind of like the size, like is it a fringe rural or remote rural? Then there are a bunch of, um, let's see, what are the, these are all flags that are like, uh, basically is it, for example, historically uh, black college or university Right? Is it a tribal university, et cetera? Uh, is it only for women, only for men? Uh, is it distance education only? Most of these are, are, are generally false for most schools except for a couple. Um, oh, and then uh, whether or not tests are required. Um, cool, and then the scorecard data is gonna give you these things. Uh, these variables come from the scorecard data where they tell you uh, the number of students by academic year. So in most cases, we're going to just filter to like the most recent academic year for a school. And um, yearly cost is similarly an average cost to attend the school, um, again, by academic year. So these are these are some of the variables we're going to be playing around with. And uh, hopefully by the end, I don't know, we'll learn something about um, about colleges in the United States. Okay, so, uh, oh, I, had, I did have one more thing to show you before we move on to the next little bit, which is uh, I, I recently wrote a little blog post. Um, I'll share the link here if you want to just um, open that and read it later. Um, but when you are making a Shiny app, and I'm going to just copy this to make sure I have it, and then I'll move back to our studio. So when you are making a Shiny app, you know, you can create a new Shiny app by going through this new uh, R script kind of menu, click on Shiny web app, or sometimes you can just like create a new R file, right? And I don't know if you've ever seen these, when you start typing Shiny, there are these snippets. And for example, you can type Shiny app, and then uh, let me make sure I can trigger it. 
And then um, usually when that tab completion is up, I press tab and then I get like the skeleton for a shiny app. Um, and recently I've found this to be kind of limiting because it doesn't include BSLib. And uh, if I'm making a small skeleton of a shiny app, I want it to include BSLib. So I'm gonna show you how to, to fix that right now. Under tools, if you go to edit code snippets, and brings up this uh, configuration page. And here are a list of like all of the snippets that you can use. Um, but here's our shiny app snippet. And then I'm just going to add library bslib here. I'm going to change this to page. And then I'm going to use a new syntax here, which is you can kind of see it, see these up here where I'm going to say one, which means that this is the first sort of thing that can be replaced in this snippet. And I'll put in a default value here. So whichever bslib page function you like the most, you can put this here. But we just were looking at page fluid. So I'll put fluid here. And then um, and then that's it. So I'll save this. And if I delete all of these things and I go shiny app, now my shiny app snippet is uh, is a little bit a little bit different. Now it includes bslib and it includes the page function. And because I use that special dollar one syntax, um, it stops first here at page fluid. So I have a default value of page fluid, but you know, um, if I wanted to, for example, have another page here like page sidebar, I could just start typing page sidebar. And when I press tab again, it'll bring me into the into the app. And then here I can, you know, put my app things, right? And just sort of move on from there. So this uh, this saves me untold seconds on a daily basis. And uh, and it might work for you too. So um, maybe you'd like that. So um, just uh, you can save that blog post and, and walk through that later. All right. So now that we're up and running, let's talk about some of these layouts that we have in, in BSLib. Um, I'm going to try this and hope that it works. So I have um, a, I have Shiny, this is a Shiny Live app running in, in the website. Um, you could, you could use this too if you want to like type along or for this part, you could just watch too if you want. So um, we've seen page fluid. Right, I'm gonna. Um, I have a little package called Lorem Ipsum that I like to use uh, when I'm making like these sort of example UIs. And here I'm gonna just add. And whenever you use, so the first argument is the number of paragraphs, and the second argument is the number of sentences in each paragraph. So here I made like two paragraphs of of just placeholder text. And um, so you can kind of get a sense for what happens with page fluid. So page fluid is just like fluid page where it stretches to the full width of whatever viewport you have. There's also page fixed. So that is the same as page as a fixed page in shiny. And this is it now has a little bit of a border. I think that's basically the only thing is that like it, it doesn't go full width um at uh, at certain screen sizes like here you can see it's limited to the sort of the center of the screen that's the, basically the only difference between page fixed and page fluid um okay uh and then we have a new function called page sidebar and page sidebar is going to let me make this slightly bigger okay so page sidebar basically you know, it has a, a main content area on the right, and then it adds a sidebar to the left. And there's nothing in this sidebar because I didn't put anything in the sidebar yet. So to put something in the sidebar, you're going to use the sidebar argument and then the sidebar function. So you, you pass the sidebar to sidebar. And here you can put, uh, you know, whatever you want. So um, uh, like a numeric input value. Let's see. I'm just going to say n. Let's make this really easy. And I'll run this. Okay. And now we have, you know, an input in the sidebar. So this is a great place to tuck away inputs that you want to be accessible and you want them to be, you know, available to the user, but also um, you, if you want to let the user kind of like hide them and just focus on whatever it is that's in your main content area, like, um, you know, like focusing on a plot or something like that. But you have this sort of drawer 
uh, sidebar of, of inputs that you can work with. So page sidebar also takes a title, my first sidebar app. Is the there we go? Okay, so it takes a title, and if you give so if you give it a title, it sort of creates this kind of reminiscent of a nav bar kind of feel. So you have a nice so this is a really good layout for a dashboard where you have one page on the dashboard. Um, you know, you just have you know what this page here where there's maybe you know one one two three maybe four plots, but there's there's only one page to the dashboard. Um, so this is a good a good fit for that kind of app. We also now have um, well well yeah so the so the title you could also give title to sidebar um, like you could maybe call this sidebar settings and if you give a title to the sidebar there's a we add a title here to the top of the app or to the top of the sidebar so most of the time and, and at least in the apps we'll see today I just sort of leave that off. Um, let's see, there's a few other arguments here. So if you want to customize the sidebar area, you can, you can do that. You could do something like say, I want my background to be red. This is going to be a bit bright, but it'll still work. Um, <clears throat> and you could make your foreground white. Um, and so, you know, using these settings from the, from the sidebar, you can, um, you can change sort of the appearance. You can also decide what side it appears on. So you can say position equals right to move it over to the right side of the app. And now it's over here on the right instead of being on the left. And you can also choose whether or not you want it to be open or closed. So we'll say closed as at start. So this Argument just the open argument just decides whether or not it's open or closed at the time when the app loads. Um, but the user might, you know, open it or close it themselves. So it's not going to stay closed permanently. Um, if you want it to stay open for always and always, um, you can say open is always. And then, the, then there's no way that you can collapse this sidebar. So you're kind of, you're stuck with it and it's, uh, but it's at least there all the time. Okay, so so th let's see. This is a page sidebar with the sidebar as we talked about. So we also have a bunch of components in BSLib. So things that have been sort of introduced in newer versions of Bootstrap that we thought were really cool and we want to bring to Shiny. Um, and one of the biggest of those is the card. So you can take a card and just give it some content and you get um, something that looks kind of like this. Uh, it's scrolling a little bit because of just the size of my screen and everything. Is this a comfortable, if this is too small, let me know in the chat, but I'm gonna stay here, I think, because this is fits enough on my screen. Um, okay, so cards basically just like give you a border and then it's like a way to put a little box around some content. Um, but there are, other parts of the card too. So the first thing that happens is everything that you give to the card basically is implicitly part of a thing called card body. So um, we basically take all of the the children that uh, you know the things that you put inside of the card and we wrap it into a card body and we just do that for you automatically. Um, but now that you've seen card body, that implies that there's some other parts to the card. And there are. So there's a card header. So here's where you would give your card a title, like my cool card. Right. And with the with the card header, and now you have a sort of top area to the card. There's also a card footer. Um, more information about my card. And that does the same thing, but for the bottom of the card. So this is a great place to put like attribution or, you know, notes about a plot or something like that. And uh, the card header is the best place to sort of tell people about what is inside of the card. All right. If you have more than one card, I'm going to, let's keep these. I'm going to just copy this and paste it. So now I have two cards. 
now that I have two cards, um, you can see that the way that this works in page sidebar is they are now kind of stacked on top of each other. And um, yeah, and there's a question about can the card height be adjusted to the height of the content? Let's save this out for just a second. And you can see this is a pretty tall card. We're going to talk about this in just a little bit, why this is a tall card. And um, we'll talk about, we'll kind of get there. Um, and basically, you know, the next, next section. So it's a great question. Just hold on to it for a second. Okay, so here we have these two cards. So what if you want the two cards to be next to each other instead of stacked on top of each other? Um, you can see this function is listed up here. So that's probably the last one I want to use. So layout columns. Um, layout columns is basically going to take things that take some things like here card and it's going to put them into columns. So it's kind of like it's kind of like row and column from shiny came together into one function where you um, you don't have to do so much wrapping anymore. So I can just take these two cards that I've created and move them into layout cards. And now that they're in layout cards, or sorry, layout columns, now that they're in layout columns, they're going to be laid out in a column wise fashion, right? So we have these two um, cards next to my other card, so we can tell them apart. So we have these two cards uh, next to each other. Um, and layout columns, you can basically just give it as many things as you want, and it will just lay them out in a um, in a way that sort of makes sense um, and until it doesn't. And then that's the, the time when you have to learn, you know, other other arguments to layout columns. We're going to cover that um, in the next in the next hour. So, OK, so this is that's page sidebar and layout columns. And so now it's your turn to check out uh, value boxes. Or sorry, it's your turn to, to just practice some of the stuff that we that we just did. So um, basically, the, the goal with exercise two is that we're in the process of refactoring an older shiny app that uses these we could, because we wanted to use these new features from VSLib. And I've started the refactoring process by pulling out the inputs so that if you just go find the section of UI, um, you can just like everything is just one line each so that you can move everything around a bit. Your task as a group is to migrate the UI section of the app from fluid page and sidebar layout to use these new page functions, uh, maybe even a card, maybe even a, um, a layout columns uh, in the app. And uh, so give it a shot. So I'm going to send everyone back to the breakout rooms. And if it, um, and then also if you want to sort of stop at some point and get up and and uh, um, and take a break, um, I'll I'll send a message when in five minutes, basically, to, to suggest that you do that. Okay, so I'm going to send everyone to the breakouts now. Go have fun.
All right, welcome back. Um, how did that go? All right, we could use reactions, I guess, for this. If I could find them. That went well. Uh, not well. You could, or you could ch chat. Where did my chat go? I don't understand why every time I move around, Zoom moves everything around. Hang on. So some people that seemed to go pretty well. I have a sense f that that was also probably a little bit not quite enough time for some other people. Um, so let's do it together real quick. Um, the idea was to take this app here um, and number two, <clears throat> uh, which is not that app, it should be this app. It looks something like this. Let me make that go away. Okay, so we get this nice, so we have kind of a sidebar layout, but also um, everything's kind of stacked on top of each other. Um, yeah. Okay. So there's a couple things we can do. First of all, instead of fluid page, uh, we have BSLib here already, so we can just start making changes, right? So we do page sidebar here for, instead of fluid page. Um, that's, is that going to do what we want? <laughs> that, that almost works. So we're, yeah, now our whole page is in the sidebar. So that's close, but not quite what we want. We want, uh, we have a title panel which we can turn into the title argument of page sidebar. This sidebar panel, I'm going to just move that up one. Uh, and to do that, you do option arrow up or arrow down option or on Mac or alt on Windows. So that's a super handy trick that I use all the time when I'm writing shiny apps. So this is going to be sidebar instead of sidebar panel. And we pass it to the sidebar argument. And now I'll pick this uh, command I, or I think it's control I on Windows to get everything lined up correctly. And that puts it all in the sidebar. And then I could just I could start here and just take all this stuff. Oops. Um, hold on. Take all this stuff out of the main panel and the sidebar layout. There we go. So I have a feeling something. Where am I? Yeah, there we go. And reload the app. And now, yeah, this is now this is certainly an improvement, right? I have the sidebar is over here. It can be hidden, and I have these things. I guess you know the next step is that these. It'd be nicer if these were cards, right? So I could take this and put it in a card. And it would also be helpful if it had a title, right? So I could put a card header over here and say admissions rate, which I'm just kind of reading from the, the output variable. And you can see that that's going to, you know, put that whole plot in the card, which is nice. So I'll just do that for the rest of these card header uh, completion rate. And I'll move this up and card card header actually hang on let's just do these two as cards and then i'm gonna try one other thing so once you get here that's pretty good so you have these two cards um these are kind of these plots are you know don't need to be super like they don't they don't need a, t a lot of horizontal space right now they're taking up like the whole width of the app right um, so I'm going to use layout columns here and I'm just gonna, let's see, this is, this is the way I usually like to do this is take this parentheses and move it here and then grab everything, command I to re-indent and get rid of that extra line. And now we've got the two cards next to each other. So this is pretty, this is, this is a nice improvement. Like I could, I... I could live with this app. Um, we haven't really like touched any parts of it yet. So if you play with it a little bit, you can see, you know, okay, the sidebar, it works, right? And this part here works as well. Um, uh, did anyone play with the group by? What happens here with this one? Um, notice there's a little divider here to kind of separate it from the others. So this input only controls this plot over here. Um, it controls the color variable for the plot. And this is 
plotting the average cost over uh, compared to median earnings for each school, right? You can hover over and see some information. Okay, um, so this because this input controls something that's just about this plot, it doesn't make as much sense. It's, it's kind of different from these other inputs, right? These other inputs control every plot. So whenever I change anything from these inputs, every plot in the app updates. But if I change only the group by, then the only the group by updates, or so only this plot updates, right? Um, how can we fix this? Well, page sidebar uh, is powered by a function underneath called layout sidebar. And it's a lot like, it basically works in the same way that we've seen so far. Uh, and it's also a little bit like layout columns. So what I can do here is say layout sidebar. Um, and I can move the plot output in there. And I can say side sidebar equals sidebar and local inputs would go here. I'll reload this so you can see we're getting we're getting close. So now, um, now I have the now I have basically a, a layout sidebar with this local input is going to end up there, right? And I just have to make that actually happen. So I'm going to get rid of this divider. I'm going to take this input group by and move it all the way down into the sidebar, line everything up, and now um, now I have a sidebar with global inputs that control every plot. And I have a local sidebar that's kind of wrapped around this one plot with the input that controls just this plot. So this is an important concept in general when you're designing your Shiny apps and you know designing dashboards with BSLib. Um, it's important to think about where the inputs are in relation to the things that they control. So global inputs that are in a in a sidebar should probably control everything on the page. And you have this option of using a layout sidebar. Um, and you can even put this in a card. So I can even just say, wrap this whole thing in a card, move that down and put that in a card. And now I have a, I have a card with a sidebar that uh, can, is you know related just to this output that it that it updates all right that's harsh all right here we go uh new layouts so there's another kind of um there's another kind of card it's kind of like a special card um like a card variant called a value box and i'd like, I'd like to show it to you now so a value box, you might be familiar with these a little bit from Shiny Dashboard has a similar function. I think it's just called a box there. And there's a Flex Dashboard has another notion of this idea, right? But at its core, a value box takes um, a title where you would say like, I don't know, average cost, um, uh, maybe average yearly cost. And it's gonna take a value, which here would be, I don't know, 42,400. And, you know, if you want to format this, well, because I'm typing it out, I could do that. And you get um, a box that looks like this. Um, yeah, these pair, these, by the way, these values pair really nicely with the scales package. So there's, a, in the scales package, there's a bunch of different functions you can use dollar for example and i can say 42 40 42 400 and and let it let uh, the scales package do that formatting for me but um but basically yeah you have a title and a value there's also a theme argument where you can say basically what color or what color theme you want to use for this value box so i could choose primary or secondary you can also use so those are all like the Bootstrap has this whole idea of um, theme colors, these are like semantic colors, like success. Maybe if, uh, if this is a good value, you would use success. And if it's a bad value, you might use danger. Um, you can also use like any, basically any named color, um, like purple. And then there's a few other options that are available to you. 
And then finally, the other final, the other big piece of a, of a value box is the showcase. So in the showcase is kind of a good place to put either an icon or a plot. And for icons, I really like BS icons, the package BS icons, which has a function called BS icon. And then uh, I just have to remember what these are, what icons are available. So I'm going to go to, I'm going to search for bootstrap icons. And it brings me to this page for bootstrap icons. And here you have like the whole list. And I was wanting money, something money related. And cash stack seems very appropriate. So I'll just remember that and come back to where I was and say cash stack. And now I have uh, the cash stack uh, showcase. If I take out the theme, this is the sort of default treatment in the shiny preset to give it a kind of uh, kind of nice um, gradient and everything. So uh, in the next exercise, it's your turn to, to turn a couple of those things into value boxes. Uh, exercise, exercises for uh, number three, um, it contains the start of a dashboard. I've kind of worked out all of the reactive side logic for you. And your goal is to make three visually appealing value boxes that describe the number of undergraduates at a school, the average yearly cost and the rate of completion. And uh, there's a, you're, you're not like completely on your own here. There's an app that I built, uh, which is available online or through this command that, um, that you can run in your, uh, in your project. And it will actually, let me show it to you. I mean, so I can even warm it up and make sure that it's ready for everyone to come over here and look at it. Um, <coughs> And while that's warming up, let me just come back to the instructions. So the I'm going to copy this uh, link here into the website or into the chat. So if you want to open up this, the instructions and have them next to you while you're working on this exercise, that's a great place to do it. And um, I'll also make sure that I copy this into the chat uh, when everyone goes into their breakout room. So if you're wondering what you should be doing, um, that's a good place to look. So the build a box app looks a lot like this and through it, you can customize basically all of the little features of the, of a value box. Um, you can do it globally. So here um, you could pick, let's say I want to use uh, semantic background colors and you can swap out the theme quickly and see what it looks like. If I want to use a plot, an icon instead of a plot, you can do that. And you can also click on an individual card and it will bring up individual settings for the card. There's a helpful little, well, first of all, you could say, you know, like um, average yearly cost and you could put in the value. So 42, some made up number that I just came up with right now. Um, and then you can use this to search through the icons and maybe find cash stack that way. And then at the top of the app, there's a show code button. And when you click on this, it'll give you uh, the code for the three value boxes that you're looking at. And maybe in this case, you'd want to just copy this one. So that's a, a nice way to kind of get started exploring all of your value box options. Okay, uh, I'm going to send everyone to, I'm going to shuffle the breakout rooms and um, send everyone to a new breakout room. And uh, We'll be back probably around uh, the middle of the hour.
Come back. How'd they all? Oh, they're about to close. Still not, not, not everyone's not back yet. All right, welcome back. How did that go? Um, leave a note in the chat if it went well, didn't go well. Um, I wonder how far, it, it's, um, it's hard to tell um, how things go in the breakout room. So if, um, so any feedback afterwards is, is much appreciated. Um, okay, so let's see. So, so first of all, you know, I feel bad about these apps, these example apps, because it is very hard to, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff that doesn't totally matter for the task at hand. Um, but I just to help orient everyone, usually, like the part that we're caring about is the UI part. So you can usually find the UI part and come here and, and start working. So let's do one of these together. I'm going to run this app so that it shows up. Um, here we go. Okay, so there's nothing there yet, but there's going to be something. So we'll do one value box together. So the idea that was to take to have a value box. Here, the value box is going to be the title of the value box will be uh, number of undergrads, right? That makes sense. And then the value, the idea was that you'd pass this text output to the value of the value box. Um, and I've already done the work there to like, you know, hook this text output up. You can go down and look real quickly. So this is a, a render text, uh, which pairs with the text output, creating an output called text and undergrads. And then basically just, you know, checking here that we have data. And if we don't, we say no data. In other words, we format this like a number. So you can go through a couple and you see that you know, it changes. And you can look up your favorite university here if you want, um, or just kind of cycle through them. Okay, did anybody try anything else? Did anybody add an icon or do anything else to the value box? Um, this would be a great time to open up the chat and get ready to to give me an answer and we'll, we'll do this together. So I see someone um, are, um, did an icon and theme. So could you give me an icon? Just uh, what kind of backpack? Cool. That's uh, is that from BS icons or from Font Awesome? That's in the next challenge. It sounds like a Font Awesome one. F A I backpack. We'll try that and reload. Hmm. Okay. Hang on, I'm gonna have to go look that up too. So build a bot, oh, it's in BS icons. Nice. I really like BS icons, by the way. Um, it's my first choice. All right, let's reload. And would someone like to give me a theme? <laughs> oh, no, because it's not icon, it's showcase, thank you. It's, uh, there we go. A theme success. Success. Oh, that looks nice. Theme success. Anything else? Anybody play with any other part? Um, okay, I'll show you two other little things you can do. We have a showcase. There's another argument called showcase layout. And you can, there are basically three options to pick from here. Uh, the default is left center. It's on the left side and kind of centered vertically. Um, there's another one which is top right. And if you choose that one, um, the showcase area shows up on the top right, and it depends a little bit on the layout of your value box. You can see it kind of sticks to the top right there. Um, and then the last one is bottom. Bottom is not recommended for icons, but it works really well with, um, with plots. I'll, I'll talk about that in one more second. The other really, the other kind of cool thing for theme is there's a whole uh, section on these gradient themes. So you can set um, your theme to something like BG gradient. And then you pick two colors that Bootstrap knows about, like purple, red, you know, something like that. 
I'm going to put um, showcase layout back where it should be. And you can get these, um, these really cool sort of popping colors. Um, and the value, the value box app is a good way to kind of like work through which ones look best in, in your app. Um, I don't know, purple, red, purple, blue, red, blue. That's not good. Purple, uh, purple, blue might look good. Okay. So um, another thing that you can do with the value boxes is instead of a, an icon here, you can also put a plot. When you use a plot there, um, stop this app and start this other one. Well, I'll show you what this looks like. Um, <clears throat> you can get these kind of spark line effects. Okay, the there's a couple two there's a couple important things here to make this work. First of all, for the showcase, I've now I've changed it out from a text output or sorry from an icon to a plotly output, and here I have a spark line for the number of undergrads, and I'm using plotly for this. And then I've set showcase layout bottom. This is kind of where they look the best. And then the other thing is the argument of full screen is true. And if you set full screen equals true, you get this button in the bottom corner. This argument also works for cards as well. And you can click on it and open it up and get a, you know, like a more detailed view of the plot, right? So you can get a sense of the plot from this spark line, but you can also open it up and, and do that. Do it that way. The um, I basically uh, have completely offloaded remembering how to do this to the Bootstrap doc, or the BSLib docs. So I'll show you how to get there. If you go to the BSLib documentation page under components, you'll go down to value boxes, and then at the bottom of the of this article is a section on expandable spark lines. And um, every time I do this, and I'm not joking, I come here, I copy this code, and I modify it a little bit so it works for whatever I was wanting to do. Um, in this case, uh, you also, you know, now that you're, you know, in this workshop, maybe there is a function here in this app. This this time when I did it, I copied it into a function, and maybe you know you could copy this function into your app instead um, if you want, and to have it kind of work the same way that uh, it does here. Um, the, the trick for the most part is like, is basically making things transparent, using some options to kind of get this transparent background. And then, um, and then there's a little bit of JavaScript in here that knows when we've moved into the full screen card and it like, then it reveals the, uh, the X axis or maybe some other part of the, the plot. So, um. So yeah, just you know, make a little note and uh, come back here the next time you want to make a plot that looks like or um, a value box that looks like this. Okay, so let's talk about some column layout. Let's talk about these column layouts and how they work. It turns out there's actually in BSLib we have two column layouts. Uh, we have layout column wrap and we have layout columns. Both of them kind of operate in the same. They they, they sort of work the same way from the outside but uh you know the details of how they work is are all slightly different so um in general you can basically give either of these functions just give them a bunch of of things give them a bunch of cards and they'll they'll lay them out into columns and you can broadly think of them like replacing row and column from base shiny um what is what is primarily different about them is the fact that layout column wrap is is really good for when you have basically the same thing, the same size of thing in, in each item. And layout columns is really good when you wanna kind of replicate Bootstrap's 12 column grid. So when you want uh, sort of like maybe slightly differently sized columns or, or rows that are, are sized differently as well. So I'm gonna show you how, we'll see this in the next demo and um, and we'll kind of see how this works. Okay, so here's uh, here's what I'm gonna do. I have this app. Um, I have an input here that we're gonna pick like the top, you know, one through twenty schools, right? And I first of all, I need to make a value box for for them. So this code is gonna basically like if I have the name and the average cost of the school, then I'm good to go, right? So um, so what I 
but I need to do this for each value box. So a way of doing this easily um, is either with per or l apply. I like per. Um, and I like this function called pmap because it, it makes it really easy to apply a function to every row in a data set. So I have top n schools, which is a data set containing uh, what you would think the top end schools uh, where I've you know done some filtering and I've picked you know the the you know the number that matches this input here and then um, basically for each row in that data set I'm going to look at the, I'm going to use the name and I'm going to use the cost average column and then I'll just ignore everything else so that's where the dots come in and then if I uncomment this and move it up indent it a little bit now I'm going to make a value box that has a name and the average cost and I'm going to just pick from one of these pick randomly from one of these columns right so and this is all inside of a reactive which means that somewhere else I can call cards to get um, to get all of these cards in one place so the next step is I have a, a UI output for laying out the cards which is defined here. And I have this helpful comment that reminds me this is where I wanna lay out the cards. So I can pick a function. I'll start with layout column wrap. Um, this is a good place to start because everything is a value box and value boxes are all basically the same size. So this makes sense. And I'm gonna give it the cards, um, right? So this is a reactive. So I have to, you know, I have to call it. I have to put the two parentheses afterwards. And it's going and it's going to be a list. So what happens with pmap? It's like map or l apply, is it'll apply this function and then it returns a list where each item in the list is one value box. And there's one last detail that makes this all kind of work that is important, and that's the triple bang operator. So the bang bang bang, or three exclamation points. And um, that's from Arlang, and it's also used in like dplyr and a couple other places. But it basically says like take this list of things and just just like splat it out here into this function. So it's the same as if I had done like cards one, cards, cards two. Uh, but you, but I don't have to type it all out. So um, this is a a common uh, a common enough thing that I thought I you know it's it, it's a little bit esoteric but also um, it, you know common enough for shiny apps that I would show it to you so the triple bing operator takes those cards splats them out into the layout column wrap and now if I run this I should have um, <laughs> the, a whole bunch of value boxes okay so and I'm going to use this app now to show you the differences between layout column wrap and layout columns um, so here I'm using layout column wrap and you can see that like as I drag the size of the window around the layout shifts a bit, but one thing that is the same is that the row like the height of every element in the row is the same for all three rows and the width of every element in the columns in the column direction are also that's also the same the column widths are the same. Um, so layout column wrap is about dividing the space evenly between the items and keeping them consistent. Um, you can decide uh, basically how wide these elements should be with the width argument of column layout column wrap. So for layout column wrap, you can say width. So by default, if I am only changing this argument, what this argument means is that when is, uh, is it's the number of pixels. So if I say 300, it means when there are 300 pixels of space available for me in a row for an item in a row that that item will move into the row so um, it's probably easier to just sort of show you so at this at this point um this the window is small enough that there isn't like there isn't enough space for this value box to be 300 pixels wide and also this one to be 300 pixels wide. But as I grow the, the screen size a little bit, now all of a sudden there's enough space for both, for two items to be at least 300 pixels wide. And if I keep going, eventually there'll be enough space for three items to be 300 
pixels wide and you get there. Okay. So layout column wrap is, is great for these kinds of situations where you have stuff that's always the same size and you wanna be able to say easily, like I want, I want them to be at least X number of pixels wide. Okay. There's another approach to layout column wrap where you give it um, an, a fraction and this is also an easy way of saying, so if you give it a fraction of like one divided by three, that means a third, like each item will be a third of the row. And in this case, you will always have three cards per row at any size, almost any size. So you always have three cards per row. But why don't we have, why is it now just one card per row? So actually what happens here, we've entered the like mobile screen size when it's this, when it's, you know, less than basically less than 576 pixels wide. And in those cases, um, BSLib is going to just, is going to say, okay, hang on. You, you probably don't want everything smashed into these little tiny rows. We'll just make everything stack on top of each other. And we go back to sort of a normal flow layout. Um, Okay, so those are the those are kind of the two big choices for layout column wrap. You could either say you, you want a fixed number of, of items per row, or you can say I want each item to be at least 300 pixels wide. All right, what happens if I switch to lay, from layout columns to or sorry layout column wrap to layout columns? And at first glance, this is pretty much the same. This looks pretty similar. Um, except layout columns uses bootstraps 12 column grid. So if you've used row and column before, you might've said, you know, row column width equals something, width equals two. And then you make sure that everything in the row adds up to 12 and it'll kind of lay out that way. Um, if you just give layout columns a bunch of items, it'll pick some numbers that kind of make sense. You know, here, uh, let me find something in the middle, but there are always points where it, it it's like the default that it picks is not quite what you would probably want. Let me see if I can find one of those, something like this. Okay, as you can see, like it does a pretty decent job. Here we go. Now, once it's wide enough, you know, it tries to fit uh, as many as it can on a row. Um, so. In these cases, you know, what was the bad one? Seven, right? Um, so layout columns has call widths as the argument. And here you can, um, it's, you think in terms of 12 units, you have 12 units to allocate per row. And maybe in this case, I want to have like, um, I don't know, we'll, like, we'll start, we'll have like a small, a medium, and a large, um, which would work out to two, four, and six. So we're going to basically have three columns. The first column gets two units, the second column gets four units, and the third column gets six units. And you end up with um, something that looks like this. So you can see the first column has two units, four units, and six units. Um, if you want, if you know, you know, I want to have four items per row, you can set this to a single value. Call width equals three. Um, so you just have to divide by 12 divided by three is four. So you got four items per row or three items by 12 divided by four is three. And then you get this. Um, you can also do the advantage of this is that you can do things. You can also use a function called breakpoints from BSLib to do something different at each breakpoint. So you can say at medium, I want, I want four at small or sorry, at large, I want three units per column. Let's see if this works. So here, there we get um, four units at medium, at a medium screen size, and then at a large screen size, it drops down to three. So you can have um, wildly different layouts. And you, these could be vectors too. So you could say like six, three, three, and get a big column like that. Um, so you can, you can do a lot with that. With layout columns, you can also set row heights. 
And here again, it's a vector and you could say like one, for example, one, two, which means the first row is going to be like one unit and then the second row will be twice as big. And you can see that kind of plays out here. Um, it's hard to see with the value box how that would be helpful, but when you're working with um, when you're working with cards or plots or more complicated layouts, um, this is this is super useful. Um, the other advantage, you know, over this approach, so basically layout columns pulls all of this sort of logic about how the columns should be columns and rows should be laid out up into like the parent function, and that means that you could take this set of cards and you can move it around more easily so if you decide later you know i have layout columns here but i actually really just want this to be layout column wrap you don't have to rewrite the arguments of each function that's holding each card all the way down you can you know just change layout columns to layout column wrap and um and switch between them and of course you do have to update some arguments but um but at least they're in one place that's the idea okay so let's uh let's go ahead and do exercise number four and basically this app this exercise has three value boxes one plot and one map but they are unorganized and they need your help so your goal is to use one of the two functions layout columns and layout column wrap to get a good layout for your for your app um, i'm going to send everyone back into the the breakout and again, we're approaching the top of the hour, so I'll send a message for anyone as a reminder for anyone who wants to get up and walk around a little bit in a few minutes. Um, all right, have fun.
Okay, welcome back. And hopefully the fact that some people came in right at the end means that uh, you were having a good time in your breakout rooms um, and, and not struggling with the exercise. But uh, let's take a look. So this is what, uh, what I had, uh, where, where we started, right? We got some smooshed value boxes that don't have enough space, um, this plot and a map, and we want a, a slightly better layout. So um, would anyone like to offer a suggestion about which functions we could use? I'm just going to say, I think these value boxes probably go together. What, what function did you use for the value boxes? Or what layout did you put them in? We tried out for Eric uh, to use a layout uh, column wrap. Okay. Layout yeah, column wrap. You said tried. How did it go? It, go, it went well. We just tried a couple of things. We thought it yeah. was uh, too easy just to add that. So we tried, um, you know, to remove the wrap from the name and things like that. But it went well. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's pretty good. Um, I, I it's Alma, right? It's yeah. Okay, let's focus on the the second group. These guys down here. Um, would anyone like to offer a suggestion about how to handle the plot and the map? Okay, I think so. My personal thing would be to use layout columns here. That would be my the place that I would start. And the reason is that if we go, I mean, it'll look similar when we start. It'll kind of, you know, it'll be just like that. It'll be two next to each other. But uh, but looking at these, I kind of think like this. This plot here needs a bit more space and the map doesn't need as much because you can zoom in and zoom out with the map, right? So that's why I would do layout columns so that I could say layout the call width is something like, I don't know, like eight and four. So basically the plot is going to be about twice as wide as the map. And that certainly, that certainly helps make a difference. Um, also, you could put these in cards. I probably should have, they probably should have been in cards to begin with, but um, you could put them in cards. And hang on, why did that? Maybe I do need to put them in cards. Oh, call widths. You need to, you need that S. Okay. And then um, the other thing is this layout column wrap. The problem with, the problem is that these value boxes are like we want them to take up a bit more like it works here at this layout but it doesn't really work at this layout so we want them to uh you know i think i would personally just say like make them each a third and just have always make it a row and they'll use whatever row they can okay the other um okay so where we're headed did, did yours look like this maybe um does something else that um, is important to kind of know from from BSLib. It's a kind of a new concept that we introduced, and it's called fillability. And um, in the next section, I'm going to talk about this a bit. Um, we're kind of, yeah. So don't worry about the schedule part. It, this was just an idea that I had, and um, in the end, you know, it works out how it works out. Um, I'm going to talk about filling layouts because it's it's a somewhat involved. Uh, concept, but it's, it's useful to just sort of like talk through it and see some examples. Whereas um, we're going to skip the advanced carding section because that's something that you could read later and it would make just as much sense. So with filling layouts, um, let's go back to like basically everything on the web and everything that you see in a web page is kind of surrounded by an invisible box. So you know, if you put something in a card, then you, you know, we'll draw a border around the box and you actually kind of see the box. But in general, everything on the web is this is this like is inside of a box in some way, and um, <clears throat> black elements are are um, are things like divs and paragraphs where basically they're going to take up the full width and there's like nothing 
you know, there's stuff above them and stuff below them, and they can like contain contain things, right? So uh, they take up the full width, but they're lazy about their height, which means that in general, it's what tells a black element how tall it should be is basically what things you put inside of it, right? So here I have um, here I have a card, and I have a map inside of the card, and we're gonna find our way down to just the UI part. So here I have. Um, a fixed page, right? So it's like um, just sort of a standard page. And I'm using card basic because I want to use just uh, Bootstrap's basic card styles and not BSLib's extra fancy card styles. So card basic, um, this card has a leaflet output and I've said the height of the leaflet output is 300 pixels. But if I make this 500 pixels, then the card is going to grow to be 500 pixels tall, right? <clears throat> so it's kind of driven, the, the height of the card is driven by the stuff that you put inside it. If I put in like a paragraph of text um, and run this, like this, you know, the text plus the, the map are gonna, you know, that's where the height of the card will come from, okay? But in dashboard layouts, um, we, we're often dealing with constrained space, both horizontally and vertically. Uh, so this kind of presents a problem. I'm gonna, what happens if we set the height of the card and we say like, you know, this card has to fit in something like 300 pixels. When we do that, uh, normally, um, the, the, the map that's on the inside, which is too big, is going to overflow the container and um, because the relationship kind of goes from the thing inside back up to the, the thing holding it, right? It goes from the child to the parent. And here constraining, so like the height of the child can drive the height of the parent, but not the other way around, unless you do a bunch of extra work, which is something like you, you know, set this to be height 100%. And, um, and then now you're saying, this height will follow from whatever is con you know constraining the parent. Um, the The problem with this approach of using height one hundred percent is that this is it's finicky and it also is the kind of thing where you have to be very careful about where you have set height one hundred percent and you have to make sure that it like follows all the way down and you might have to set it in a whole bunch of different places in your in your UI elements and stuff. So um, so this isn't going to work super well for us. So because Shiny deals with putting things in dashboards, we came up with this um, this concept called a filling layout, where uh, that basically answers the question of how can we take an output or a layout or a plot and have it just know to take up all of the space that's available to it, which means either growing to fill the space that it has or shrinking down to to fit inside of the space that it has, yeah. You know. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change out the basic card from that's using, you know, like basic bootstrap card for a BSLib card. And um, notice that I have this set so that the card is smaller than the plot by setting height 300 pixels. And when we use a BSLib card, um, the plot is just going to know that it had, you know, know to take up this space instead of instead of overflowing. Um, if I were to add, yeah, so let's add some text to this card. I'm going to add one paragraph with one sentence. And when I do that, so to have my one paragraph with one sentence, you can see that um, the the card is still 300 pixels tall, and uh, the map is basically fitting in the space left over available to it, right? So the map is a little bit smaller. I mean, switch back and forth, right? So the map grows to take up whatever it can. And then once we add a paragraph, it's basically like these two things are taking up as much space as, as, as they can, kind of. Um, what if I do something where I have like two paragraphs and I make them, yeah. And you can see the map is gonna keep shrinking and rather than rather than like making the card grow, it's going to keep shrinking so that you have just um, you know it's taking up the space that's available to it. So this idea of fillability um, 
basically what, what is happening here is the card is fillable and the plot fills the fills the card. And if we change page fixed for page fillable, this is a, a page that takes up the viewport height. So for some reason, okay, so like imagine this is my, you know, this area here is my browser window. This card has now, you know, has now expanded to fill up the whole the whole space available to it. And it actually kind of ignores its own, like Harry said, height should be 300 pixels. But because it's um, filling, it's going to ignore the, the it, it kind of just means something slightly different. Um, if you, so I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that in a second, like how to, how to handle heights. <clears throat> um, so because every, so that like this works really well, we've seen it in a couple of places where we, you know, you put the plots into cards and um, if I go back to the, like this, you know, this plot here is taking up all of the space that's available to it. And this map is taking up the space available to it. Another place that it kind of came up, came up is in this example with the, um, with the spark line, right? So, um, hold on one second. So the spark lines, so like this plot right now is kind of filling, it has like a little box here where it's filling it up. And when we expand the card and it grows, then the plot grows to fill that space. And then when we close the card, it, it shrinks back down to fill just the little, the little tiny space. Um, and so we use this, this idea all over the place. Um, and the, the, the basic idea that, like the concept that makes it work is this idea of two elements working together. So it's not just about a card and it isn't just about a plot, but it's about the two of them working together. So fillability, fillable layouts are created by a fillable container. And the fillable container says, you can fill this space. And then, and the sort of reciprocal of that is a fill item. They have, they are, the filling layout is activated by putting a fill item inside of a fillable container. Um, and basically, we kind of in BSLib have filling turned on everywhere. So in this example up here, the page says the page is fillable. The card says I'm, I'm a fill item. So it, the card can fill the page fillable. And it also says I'm a fillable item so that, you know, this leaflet output can fill the card as well. So um, in general, you don't have to think about this too much until you decide that you don't want it. Right. And then in those cases, then you have to then you have to think about how you're going to break this relationship. And that's where it becomes important to know that it's about the two things working together. So it's either. So when you when you need to kind of break out of this this sort of setup and you want something to either scroll or be a specific height or to be certain you know certain size or whatever um, you basically have three options to break the fillability you're going to find the item and make it not a fill item anymore you can set fill equals false so there's lots of this fill argument around in bslib and you look for that and you say fill is false or you make the parent not fillable so fillable equals false on the parent and then then the stuff inside of it won't fill it. Um, or it basically just kind of goes back to being like, you know, the regular way that things work on the web. Um, or you can break the parent child relationship. Uh, basically, like you add another div or wrapper or something that isn't fillable and you put that in the way and then they're not the parent and the child aren't connected anymore. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that we we do this kind of breaking automatically um, on mobile devices because on mobile devices you know like if if you're thinking about uh so filling works both ways it works both in expanding all the content like expanding outputs and maps and plots and things to take up the full space and it also works by contracting everything down or shrinking it to fit in whatever space is available so 
in general, you you don't really want your dashboard to just like shrink down on a mobile device. It's better to kind of just go back to the normal flow layout, which is where things just sort of stack and work their way down the page. Um, and so we do that for you. But there are cases where you might want to have fillable fillability turned on on, on mobile screens. So <clears throat> here's an example where you might want to break this, where um, break this fillability. So first of all, so I have this card, right? And I have a card with a bunch of text and I have a, so that's kind of this section here is the, uh, the bunch of text is here, right? That's this part here in the card body. So I have a fillable page with the card inside of it. Uh, I have an action button, which is this one. And I have the leaflet output. And um, basically what's happening here is these sort of three elements are fighting for the vertical space in the card. So the, um, this, you know, this text here is, is kind of fighting for um, this, this wins because it's not fillable. It's not a fill item. Sorry. So this, this text isn't a fill item because paragraph tags are, are not fill by default. So it's basically, it's like, I'll take up as much space as you give me. Right. And then the, uh, the map is like, well, okay, there's after everybody else has been added to this card, there's only like this little tiny space for me. And, uh, and so it shrinks down. So in this case, we need to break fillability in some way. So we have a couple options and we'll, let's try them and see what happens. So first of all, uh, I have card, I have card and card body because we need to be explicit in card body. If we're going to set, we're going to say that card body is not fillable. So we say fillable is false. And in this case now, <clears throat> um, so the card is a fill item and a page fillable. So it'll still, the card itself will expand all the way, but the, but I've turned off fillability in the card body. And now everything in the card body is just regular. Like it just flows. So, um, so it doesn't try to take up, it doesn't try to shrink or grow. It just takes up its natural height. So we have like this, you know, all the text is here, our button is here, and then we have, um, and then we have the plot, and the plot is like the default 400 pixels size, right? So that's one way you could do it, and then you have a scrolling card. This isn't quite what I wanted, so I'm going to take that out, and um, what I was kind of thinking of is if I move the paragraph tag, the paragraphs, into their own div, then they'll be grouped together. And, um, and that, that didn't work either. Um, oh, I know. So we actually have to use card body. We, we're going to use a second card body here. And we're going to take this. And we're going to move the, um, we're going to move the text into the into the, this one card body, the first card body. And here we'll say fillable equals false. And we'll try that. There we go. And now we have like the top half is kind of scrolling. And then the bottom half is still trying to fill. So what ha what ends up happening is this one takes up, the, you know, it takes up half of the card. This takes up the other half of the card. And, um, and they kind of share the vertical space. Um, filling and fillability and filling are kind of, they're, they're a bit tricky. Um, and there's a, basically there's an article and hold on, I'm going to go find the article. So the, the best place to like read about this and like really take your time kind of digesting it is, um, at BS lib. If you go to layouts, uh, and then filling layouts, um, we kind of walk our way through through this. Um, let's go back. So there are a couple places, a couple pages that have fillability turned on by default. Um, first of all, page fillable is pretty obvious. Uh, fill, it basically, you know, like the idea is to get everything to fit into one screen. Um, and this would be good for like a, a dashboard that's that's basically supposed to like take up the whole layout. And um, you can add a title if you want. You could do something like say H2 um, title. 
um, you know, and then basically everything is going to kind of share whatever height and width is available to it. Um, page fillable comes with with uh, with some arguments that are are useful, and you'll see them in a lot of different places. So first of all, you can decide how much padding is around the outside edge by um, with the padding argument. I can make these go all the way to the edge by setting padding equals zero. Or I could give them, you know, lots of extra padding by saying like something like two rem, right? I can, um, the gap is, so basically these layouts are driven by um, a CSS uh, feature called flex. So you can say gap equals zero, and that is going to control the space between each element at at this level at the page level so you can see that it, it uh you know there are three levels here there's the first level first row second row and third row right and everything in between them there's zero space layout columns also has this argument and you can say gap zero there and now you have um you know you have a really tight layout but you can make this bigger and you could say one rem or um or pick another value for some reason I might want one on the page level things and two in the in the layout columns when you if you do want filling to happen on mobile screens you can use fillable mobile equals true and that's going to give you something that looks like this so now you know I have the filling layout and um and it continues to be filling on mobile. And because I have a layout columns here, I'll also have to set say I want this to be fillable on mobile as well. Um, at least I feel like I remember that. But okay, for at least for the outside layout, that, that works. Um, in page sidebar, the, the main area is fillable also. So the same kind of logic applies. Uh, you can, you know, do, um, you can use gap and you can use padding. Sometimes you'll need to use these to, you know, like if you have a, uh, if you have a layout that you want to kind of live at the edge, imagine like a really big map that you want to put in here, you'll want to set padding equal to zero. And, um, and last but not least, we have page nav bar. So page nav bar is a lot like, um, so page nav bar is, you know, creates this, let's see if we can get it there. So it creates a, um, a nav bar page where you can flip between um, different sort of pseudo pages. And, um, and to create a, so basically these are, um, page nav bar is gonna take nav panels inside of the page nav bar and turn each nav panel into, so here I have the first nav panel is named one and that becomes the, the tab target, right? The thing that you click on. And then you have the things that go inside of the content of that, that um, sort of navigate, that sort of page element or whatever. Um, this, this naming also works for this, these nav panels work in, in a bunch of other places. Like um, we have nav set cards that have tabs on them. Um, you could use an, a nav bar or a nav tab on its own, nav set bar or a nav set tab on its own. And in every case, you're going to kind of say what content is grouped with which uh, sort of tab control by using a nav panel. Um, it's hard to see here, but a thing that we really like is to do something like this, where you say like, title is my dashboard. Um, so you give it a title and that puts the, you know, that puts the title up here in the left corner. And then we have another, um, we have a little function called nav spacer. And what nav spacer does is it basically just pushes everything in the nav bar to the other side. Um, and if you put nav spacer here, you can push the uh, tabs to the end and then you get this kind of, this nice setup for, um, for your tabs. You can also use nav item if you want to create something in the um, in the in the nav bar, like a GitHub link or something like that. 
and um, you, you know, I'm just showing very quickly, but you'd want to use like BS icons to put the icon there and, and make it an actual link. Um, but nav item basically makes something in the nav bar area without associating it with some content that's going to be shown when you click on the tab. Okay, so it's your turn to do a little bit of this. Um, in exercise five, there's a few plots. Some of them should be familiar from some of the previous exercises, but there isn't enough layout or enough space in the, in the layout. So your task for this exercise is to try to find a new layout that you can see these plots and you can see, um, you can, you can see the elements. And you definitely wanna use layout columns and layout column wrap again. And you will also want to use um, page nav bar and uh, nav panel. Um, and then and there's one more thing, which is that if you have that, I'll just show you really quickly. If you have like a row of um, value boxes, for example, and you want to let them define how tall they are, which is a good idea usually. On layout columns, you would set fill false, which is going to break the filling fillability relationship. And it means that these this row is basically going to be as tall as it wants to be and the other rows will adapt. So this is a using fill equals false is a great way is a great thing to do when you have um, value boxes in a, in a layout columns or layout column wrap. Okay, so with those hints, you're going to go into exercise five, and I'm going to keep the same breakout groups. It seems like it's working, and um, check the chat if you need some hints or uh, reminder about the instructions. Um, I'll see you in a few minutes.
All right, welcome back. Lots of people hanging out until the very end of the breakout, which is hopefully a good sign, at least that you're enjoying the people you're in the group, the group with. <clears throat> but um, let's let's go through the exercise of, of doing this together again. So um, here's the app that uh, you probably started out with. It's um, it's hard to read anything, right? Um, so this is one of the sort of problems with the fillable layouts is that you get stuff that looks like this. There's one really easy way of solving this problem, which is you can say fillable equals false here under side, page sidebar. Um, and you can make that main area not fillable anymore. Kind of works. Like this might be what you wanted. It makes nice big, you know, everything is nice and big and it takes up the whole, like, you know, it kind of fits. And then you, I don't know, I guess from here you would kind of work your way through and, you know, give these cards different heights and, and do all of that. Um, but it would probably be a little bit better to do something slightly different, um, which would be to take some of these things and put them and to kind of break them up, first of all, between a couple different pages. So the thing that speaks to me is that we have a bunch of plots and maybe the map, you know, this like this section here feels a lot like one of the apps that we've seen before, you know, where we kind of have three plots together and, uh, and the map and this plot and the map kind of together. So we'll kind of, like we could go back to that layout and this feels like, I don't know, maybe, maybe a separate table would be better for this. So I'm going to use page nav bar and I'm also going to use nav panel. And naming things is really hard. I don't remember. Uh, we'll just call this plots <clears throat> here. And I'm going to take like all of these plot outputs and the map. Is that, yeah, we'll take all of that and we'll put it in this first nav panel. And then, so that's good. I'm going to do, can I, oh, I can't fold here. Oh, this is not my normal. Our studio setup. So okay, and then I'll make another nav panel, and I'll call this like table, because um, I'm not thinking too hard about these names right now. But once I do that, <clears throat> we're at least going to be in a better spot, probably, where you know there's less less smush, and this table kind of fits. Um, okay, so. If we want to do that same kind of now that we've kind of split it up, we can do that same trick that we just did of making some of the things um, fillable. Like we can make we could say fillable equals, and I'll make only the plots panel fillable. That's one one way of going about this. I actually kind of like this, I think, because then um, we'll have what will end up happening is we'll have this part where we'll be like, okay, we're going to kind of like rearrange everything so it fits on one screen. And then for the table, you know, it's use as much space as you need, right? Um, the other thing to keep in mind here is that we have this sidebar. The um, this sidebar argument to page nav bar becomes a global sidebar. So this sidebar persists across all of the pages, right? It's the same sidebar. And if I change the school, I go to you know some other school, University of Finlay. And, you know, this is now uh, about the University of Finlay. So then inside of nav panel, inside of this plots nav panel, it really just kind of becomes about like using our layout column wrap. And I'll just say width, width equals one third. And I don't know, grab these and put them in here. Um, something like that. And then layout. I'm just going to do a really simple version right now and say um, width equals one half and let those let these next two cards have split the difference. Okay, and you get something like something like this. So that's a little better. Right now I can actually see everything. So that's pretty close. We can see everything for the most part that we'd want to see. And this app is going to mostly work at, at smaller sizes. One other thing that I could show you that you might want to do here is like, you know, these plots, you know, they don't need to be, they don't need to be so tall. So I can set a max height on the first column and I'll say them this, they shouldn't be any taller than, I'm just going to pick a random number for right now and say 300, which is 300 pixels. 
and let's find out if this works. This is this approach is more of a um, by uh, more of a like try it out and and see if it works for your layout because every layout is going to be a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> So this kind of works. I would probably stay, I probably would go with this and then work on making these um, sort of like spark spark lines, right? And have them sort of fill that area. And by the way, you can also, so for this card undergraduate, like I'm looking at uh, average yearly costs here, right? Cards like value boxes have a full screen option. So you could say full screen is true on any of these. And it's not turned on by default because you know it's something that you need to know that you want to do. But when that's turned on, then cards also expand just like value boxes, like we saw for value boxes. Um, yeah, and this this plot looks nice. Like I, this is this is nice. And then maybe we'd, I'd set it up so that you know you have like a a less detailed view for the card or the the smaller card version. Any questions about? this task or the things that we were just talking about, fillability, nav, page nav bar, any of those things? All right, um, I'm gonna jump over to, so for the next, we, we have like 10, 15 minutes. I'm gonna show you a couple of cool things. This is gonna be more of a show and tell uh, together. So, um, there's a, we, we've seen so far, you know, you can use sidebars as a way to hide some inputs. Um, but sometimes you need, in, you need information uh, that is either something that like, can show up when you, just when you, like, it's kind of local to the thing that you're working on and you, it'll show up just when you click on an element or when you hover over something. Um, and for that, you can use popovers and tooltips. So popovers are basically, uh, well, in, in both cases, they, they work more or less the same way in terms of when you're writing the code. When you're writing the code, you wrap uh, a section and they use popover or tooltip. The first argument is going to be the thing that you interact with to, to see the popover or to see the tooltip. And then everything else is what shows up inside of the, the revealed popover or tooltip. So here I'm going to, this creates a pop, um, an icon with a gear. Make sure that when you're doing, using this approach that you give the icon a title and BS icons and font awesome um, will both set things up correctly for accessibility. And um, so now this creates a gear. And when I click on this, um, it'll reveal some content. So here's a, a, you know, the popover. Um, popovers work well with with uh, with icons like that, or they work well with uh, with buttons. As, you know, also you can even use sh like a shiny action button um, to to open the thing up. Notice that uh, by default, <clears throat> when you enable a popover, it appears, it's there, and it sticks around. Um, the reason that it does that is because in general, um, because that makes it possible to put inputs in in this section, right? Um, so let's see how we could do something like that. So imagine we have a card and here we have a, this card has a, a card header and there's a plot inside of it. And what we wanna do is we wanna have a popover that looks kind of like this, except we're gonna actually put some inputs inside of there. So um, at, at the moment, this requires a little bit of, of like custom classes. There's an HStack class from Bootstrap and that kind of makes everything, HStack is like line everything up horizontally, stack horizontally. And with one other class, this class justify content between, that is a, is a flex related class. And what it does is it says, uh, push everything so that they're as far apart as possible from each other, okay? So once you've done that, it basically, you know, it's basically saying the cost first earnings is gonna be on one side, and then the popover is going to be on the other side of the card header. And now you can you know, put something in here that um, you would use for the grouping variable, right? So you could put some inputs here that are gonna affect the plot is the idea. Tool tips are really similar. Like I said, they a tool tip um, has a trigger element. So here I'm gonna use the info circle. And in this case, um, 
in the, in the case of a tooltip, you know, you're not going to put much in there, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of content, like it's, it's just a little bit of content that's revealed when you need it. And so like help text is a good, a good thing for this. Um, so here I have a tooltip that's going to say when you hover over it, it says regular expressions aren't supported. And I've put that in as part of the label for a text input. So um, you can just use this snippet or, you know, come back to this to reference it. But basically I gave a tag list to label and then that's how we can get a couple different elements into the label area. And you can, you know, then you put whatever, you know, you look for your school or something here. Um, but this is super helpful for uh, giving a little bit of extra context around uh, inputs. Um, like I said, uh, card header and card footer are both great places to use these. And you can you can actually have multiple H stacks. So here I, I'm taking the above example, using H stack to have you know this side and then a div. So I have like a little toolbar area over here. That div then also has an H stack and then a gap. And um, yeah, the the more often I write this, the more likely it becomes that uh, we'll end up with helper functions in BSLib that would do this for you. But for now, um, it, it's a couple classes that you can put together. And so here inside of this div, I've put a popover and a tooltip. So you can, you know, you have a popover and then maybe you have your tooltip next to it. Or maybe you make them both popovers or tooltips. So let's, um, let me let me try to do this interactively instead of sending everyone to breakouts because this is a pretty uh, neat way of I'll just demo the the app for for exercise five no which it should be I got out of seven okay so we'll look at seven together all right so what I did here is I have, do you remember this, um, this plot from earlier, the cost, average cost versus median earnings, right? And I had a, an, in, um, an input, which was radio buttons that says, you know, here you have a couple choices and it's going to control the, um, the color of the variables. And before we had that in the hidden in the sidebar, but using the same idea, I have, um, you know, a card and in the card header, the H stack, and then the title and the popover. And you can click on this and see the the input. And you can see how it, you know, this input affects the plot. And this is one of the reasons why they are, um, they stick around is so that you can move between them, move between options. And when you're done with it, you click the X or, or click the trigger again, and it, it'll go away. And one second. Another way that you can group content together is with an accordion. So accordions are sort of like nav sets, um, except they, at least in terms of like their design philosophy, you know, you have one accordion collects a bunch of different accordion panels and an accordion panel has a title and then everything else is content that goes inside of it. So the first argument is, is the title and then everything else becomes the content and you can um, you know, there's a couple interesting arguments, like you can use open to decide which accordions are open by default, and you can decide which, um, you know, you can decide if one or more accordions are open at a time, and you can also give each accordion panel, each, each of these titles, they can have icons as well. So um, it's a really useful way, like here's an example um, app where you know, you can imagine it would be much better if these were sort of grouped into sections like um, like putting these two, um, ele you know, these two inputs together in an accordion that you could expand or contract as you, you know, or hide as you want. Um, the other thing I want to show you quickly in the last couple of minutes is a couple other inputs that we have in BSLib. Uh, if instead of checkbox input, like like these, if you have a situation where you want people to be able to turn something on or off, you could instead use input switch. And I'll just make all of these input switch really quickly. You can see that you can just 
basically switch from checkbox input to input switch. And you immediately get this kind of treatment where everything becomes a toggle that you can turn on and off. Okay. There's also this really cool new thing that I'm, I'm really pleased with, which is an input task button. And um, there's a, a, a neat talk by Joe Chang called Managing Long Running Operations. It, it pairs with a, a feature from recent Shiny called Extended Task, but you don't need to know any of that to be able to use it. So here I have, basically I just have an action button um, where I have decided that instead of having this plot update whenever you change one of these toggles, I want it to update when you click the action button. So I can make some changes and then click the action button. Here's the problem with this is if, what if I like click this a few times, I've just clicked it a few times and you can see like each click becomes a new recalculation and going back and figuring out, you know, redrawing the map, right? Input task button, you could basically just drop in for action button and it'll do the same thing except except better <laughs> so basically when you when you click the button it'll turn into a processing state and it will give you some feedback that some work is happening it automatically knows when that work is done and it'll uh, go back to its regular state when that happens in the meantime it won't let you keep clicking this so i'm clicking right now click, 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 and, uh, and nothing happens until it returns and then it'll, um, then it lets me click again. So this is really useful if you have something that's like a long running task, but also you wanna keep people from just like mashing the button. Um, you know, you get both the visual indication that something is happening and, uh, and it prevents them from, from clicking the button a bunch. The last feature to show you is dark mode. This is like my, one of my favorite things of all time. Um, and here's a little snippet that you can use to, to see this or to like it works really well in a page nav bar with the nav, nav spacer trick that I showed you earlier and with the nav item. It's going to be hard to see here, but you end up with a little um, dark mode switcher kind of button and you can click on that and uh, it actually will follow the current color scheme of the of the users. Um, uh system and everything so um it works works pretty well and there's there's a lot more to it but uh it, you can just basically drop it into your app and then you have automatic uh dark mode so we're coming up on the end of time and um and i had planned for a little bit more time for questions and, and everything so i will stick around after um the end of the workshop to answer any questions that you have or just to talk about Shiny or BS Lib or anything. But I really appreciate you being here and I appreciate uh, our medicine for the opportunity to, to talk about BS Lib and Shiny. And, uh, and thank you to everyone um, for, especially those who, who are leading their, the breakout groups and making that a fun experience for everyone. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Garrick, that was great. Hi, Gary. Do you mind if I ask a question? I would love that. Thank you. Um, with this new feature of Quarto emails, um, of being able to send emails by uh, POSIT Connect, um, do you know if in the future some of these amazing BSL uh, features will be added to Quarto email? It, uh, do you mean in terms of theming or? Yeah, like in the, terms of. Uh, yeah, that um, I want to get uh, to use the cards, uh, the layouts, yeah. the, you know, beautiful team, uh, the yeah. uh, emails. Um, I know it doesn't work because I've tried out. <laughs> yeah. But I was wondering if in the future uh, that would be a feature that we could use. Yeah, yeah. So I am I am working right now on, on kind of like unified, and this idea of unified theming. So the idea that um, the idea that you would want to be able to cre quickly create an email that looks like your, that follows your brand guidelines or something like that, right? Like you want to be able to, to quickly make a shiny, like use the same sort of 
uh, config yeah. file to say like my shiny app should look like this and my email should look like that and my web pages should look like this. So that's definitely um, on the roadmap. The hard part about um, the hard part about emails is that uh, it just email clients are so weird and they're so weird about HTML and how they process things. It's like designing web content for emails is basically like uh, like a totally different world. Um, mm -hmm. Stuff that works in regular websites does not is not supported in regular in, in most email clients and every email client is weird about it's it's like a whole thing so it's unlikely that the layout functions will work in emails mm -hmm. um and it's also not our fault because it's, it's like email html and css and emails is just is very broken um unfortunately do you do you have any sorry for the follow-up i promise is the mm -hmm. last one <laughs> Do you have any suggestions for me? Um, so I work at Apple and we want to do a, like email uh, for the team that has, you know, some uh, standard theme that we use internally. Um, and like so far, um, it's, I have a lot of restrictions on what I can do in part to emails. So do you have any suggestion for me uh, so I can improve how the part to emails look? Is there any package or anything? Like you said mail, no Gmail. <laughs> How is that specific? Um, no, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I have not used Quarto email as much, and or <laughs> actually at all. Like, um, uh, Quarto moves fast, and so that that's not a feature I've had a chance to play with. I have used Blastula before, um, which okay. is philosophically similar, and I think Rich Yanon is actually the person who implemented both. And, uh, and, and I have done some very weird things to try to get uh, emails to look the way that I want them. And, in, okay. and it eventually involved like actually like using regular expressions and changing CSS declarations. It was okay. not recommended. I really, <laughs> I hope that by this time next year, like the next workshop will be about how you can define um, this, the project I'm working on is is basically, you know, how you could just make a few setting declarations in like your Quarto YAML file or something and end up with, you know, apps that look that are like a website, a dashboard, emails, everything just sort of look consistent. Um, I look uh, across these tools. Yeah. Yeah, that's the so, idea. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you very much. No, no, it's um, great. Yeah. I'll, be, I'll be participating on that workshop. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for this. You're it has welcome. been amazing. Thank you. I, I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. So at the beginning of your slides, you had this, like a chart, it's really like a graph, right? Or flow chart or whatever it is, with yeah, VS Live yeah. in the middle. Yeah. Is it possible to make something like that to be a user input? Where Ooh. you can click on one of those things and then maybe yeah. you change something and then the whole diagram changes afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. Um, I Yeah, I mean, anything's possible. <laughs> That, but, it's a great but people idea. Aren't, people aren't doing that. No, I don't think so. This is, um, but I, it, it's totally possible. This is uh, driven by Mermaid. And so this is a Mermaid graph that I did in, um, that I did in, and Quarto has really nice support for this kind of thing. But it's ultimately, it's a JavaScript library that draws this. And I have, I know that I have helped people make shiny, I've helped people use mermaid graphs in shiny so it is possible and then after that it's all about just writing some javascript i shouldn't say just like that's a lot of work but it's about yeah, writing me, javascript that connects it for me it'd be a tall task but it'd be interesting if you could make each of those to be yeah and have the whole thing react to your choices and change oh yeah totally it totally do it's totally totally within the realm of possibility that's yeah, just a question of time and, and making it happen. Right. Yeah, cool. Good suggestion. Are there any other questions? I'm very happy to answer anything else. Oh, hi. Hi, my name is Agata. And actually, I have a question. Like, OK, so I am completely new to Shiny. And I am just amazed by the workshops and by the possibilities. Um, 
And I wanted to ask you like also like, okay, so maybe if you have some recommendations for how to create a personal web page. Yeah. Uh, so I highly recommend Quarto. That's, um, I guess, first of all, that's where, like what I use for my own website and, um, oh, wait, I pushed, I pushed the wrong buttons. It's Quarto.org. So if you come here, there's. This is sort of like Quarto is kind of like the next generation of our markdown. Um, mm -hmm. If you're familiar with our markdown. Yeah, but, sure, sure. Uh, We've mar yeah, I, I haven't heard about Quattro, but like, yeah. Yeah. And it, this is this is awesome. Uh, so th there's a section under guide on creating a website. There's even a section on creating a blog. And okay. um, and I I mean, yeah. So first of all, my personal website is using Quarto. And then second of all, this website that I created for the workshop um, is also mm -hmm. written in Quarto. And um, yeah, and I, I mostly, you know, uh, mostly just spend when I'm doing that kind of thing, spend a lot of time over here in the docs. Uh, <laughs> but it's, there's also the search function, which you can use in that uh, that's really helpful. But this tutorial is, a, is, is pretty great. And it's a good place to start. So um, okay, so one more question, like, yeah. um, now for my research, I'm like creating, because I'm a bioinformatician, I create the pipeline with SnakeMake. And mm -hmm. I was actually thinking if it's possible to like either build like the um, Shiny app to like visualize the data, you know, in this interactive mode and so on. Because for now, like I'm plotting 1000 plots and, you know, yeah. no one wants to go yeah. through them, obviously. So yeah, if you yeah know, totally. If, Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. There's uh, there's a section here on interactivity too, and specifically yeah. Shiny. Um, and you can you can actually write Shiny apps that are inside of Quarto documents. So you you could totally do that as one one way of doing this. Mm -hmm. um, this is th this one focuses on R, but it works just as well for Python um, okay. and Shiny for Python. There is a whole like if you're if you're using Python and you want to stay with Python, you mm -hmm. can. We actually also have Shiny for Python as well. Ah, and, okay. Um, and it's it's kind of like uh, we get to take we get to take some of the so so in the R world like some of what I went through in the workshop is limited to like you have to use Shiny library Shiny and library BSLib, and then you get to basically you get to the same place that shiny for Python is right now, which is pretty nice. Um, so okay. highly recommend that. Also, there's this section on dashboards. So mm -hmm. dashboards are, this is another way that you can make these, um, make these, make these kinds of apps like dashboard kinds of apps. This also uses a lot of the ideas behind BSLib. So if you, so like the stuff that you learned today is still going to be, you know, like it's, it's still floating around in the dashboard. And um, and uh, there's definitely a section in the dashboards about using Shiny for Python or Shiny for R. Either one will work. Um, and again, it makes a, an interactive app that uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. So like okay. So Quattro is also supporting. Oh, it's also working under Python, like with Python. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so awesome. much. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so um, I wanted to know if there is, by the way, a great presentation, and I really Thanks. enjoyed enjoyed the workshop. Um, so uh, my question was, I have some previous, like I'm uh, a little bit familiar with Shiny. I have worked uh, on some projects where I built like Shiny app to visualize the results uh, of like where I can choose different variables and get my uh, like nice plots and everything. So I wanted to uh, build um, a shiny app which has some presentations in it, but like most of the presentations are not uh, created in uh, R in general. So they are mm -hmm. maybe created in like uh, PowerPoint or something like based on like collaborative work someone else did it. So I wanted to be, uh, add that, like embedded, embed that in a Shiny app. Is that possible in any easier, like is there any easier way to like just use the presentation as it is? 
instead yeah. of like doing it once again like all over again yeah yes and no um the i think the fundamental question is can you make a web page from uh -huh. the presentation and i i don't i'm not super familiar with um it's been a long time since i've used powerpoint mm -hmm. um you know I, these days i if i need a presentation i'll use uh, i'll use quarto mm -hmm. um so yeah, that being I said use quarto for the like these days but the yeah. presentations i'm talking about is like from way back like two or three years back and i just yeah. don't want to redo those stuff <laughs> right totally totally get that yeah yeah i think the so the thing is that, like if you can turn it into a web page in some way like powerpoint might have an export to web page thing that seems possible once you have it as a um as a web page you can um you can use an, what what's called an iframe There's, you have a couple options if you're in shiny you can use an iframe to embed the the presentation in your shiny app um and then you know it, it's like a little bit of work to set it up so that it's like hosted in the it's like in the right place but for the most part like if you you would use the iframe to like so an iframe in, in web HTML is basically a way that you take one web page from somewhere else and put it into the current web page. Like technically, this block right here is a whole presentation. It's actually like its own web page and, and it's inside of an iframe. Um, and if you can do that, then 100% get it, you'll, it's easy to get it into a shiny app. Um, the hard part is getting that first step of like it where it's its own web page yeah so my best way would be creating of a page from those like slides and then yeah. trying to embed that on the shiny yeah yeah okay. exactly okay. Yeah, I'll yeah. That. i've definitely i've i know i've i've done things the other way where i've made uh powerpoint presentations out of uh like uh Sharingan slides or or like quarto slides where i've like taken screenshots and made them the like the screenshot is the slide but it's really just i have screenshots that might be the easiest way so just like export oh. the slides as png and mm -hmm. then then you have images and then you can you can do something with that yeah that that sounds easier than the one yeah. before but thank you so much for the yeah you're the welcome answer. yeah no problem Does anyone else have a question? Um, I see a few people still hanging out, <clears throat> or maybe you're already you've already moved on and went to get coffee or something. Some some folks might just stay on if they're going to the next workshop too. It's the same right. link, so. You can... Oh, great! Cool. All right. Thanks well, thank you, you so much. Great. Yeah, that yeah. was really great. This was wonderful. Bye, everyone. Bye.